good afternoon and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now the assumption for many of us is that since for our service is at three, we have lunch earlier and so we come to church with energy so that when the preacher says praise the Lord, you can even jump or even lift the pew. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are so happy to have you with us, but it also, it's also true that you can choose to have lunch after, not so? It is still okay. Let us pray. We do thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us this opportunity to come and sit at your feet to study your word together. Father, we pray that you bless us as we read your word and that you will open our eyes to the truths in your word that you will also cause us to be obedient to your word, that this word that we are going to hear will bear fruit in our lives, fruit that will last to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please do clap for my, my, my daughter for reading for us. Yes, now some of us at that age, eh? at that age for some of us, that is a story for another day. We do want to thank you for being bold to stand before us and to read. Friends, this afternoon we are studying Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 17. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 17. Now, throughout the month, we have been taking a study from this particular book. And I am certain that many of us have learned things and the Lord has graciously blessed us through his word. And so I want to be drawing back and forth so that we really get to know what God wants us to do in chapter 12. Now, when you read the first 10 chapters, that is 1, 2, 3, all through to 10, you're going to see the writer who is actually not known. We do not know who it is that actually writes for us this beautiful letter. And yet in it, the immense truths that God wants us to take. Now, the writer in his writing in the first 10 chapters is making a case for who Jesus Christ is, number one, but also making a second case of the superiority of Jesus Christ in everything. He is superior to the angels. We saw that in chapter one, superior to the prophets of the old, those that came before him, superior to even those that we think because they're heavenly beings, they are superior. He tells us Jesus Christ is superior. And all the way from chapter 1, he has been opening our eyes to reasons why Jesus is superior in every aspect. Now, having told us about the superiority of Jesus, as he draws close to chapter 11, he reminds us, of the covenant that God makes with us through his son, Jesus Christ. A covenant of cleansing and a covenant of transformation. And so as he comes to chapter 11, he is going to tell us what faith in God is. And having defined for us faith in God, he now gives us a list of people that came before us and walked by faith in God and how God rewarded each one of them. Of course, call, calling us to be those that draw an example from them and be encouraged. This is what he defines faith to be in chapter 11. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of the old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was, no, was not made out of the things that are visible. And then he gives us the list. By faith, Abel. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Noah. By faith, so and so. Making mention of things that they did that point to the faith that they had in God. Now, having told us all those things, all that list, he now comes in chapter 12 and begins by saying, there are four. And it is important for us every time we encounter this word, there are four, to ask ourselves, what is the there are four, there are four? 
Why is it there? He is calling us to now shift our attention to a series of exhortations. In light of whatever he has said from chapter 1, and chapter 1 10 and 11, he is therefore to act calling us to act in a certain way because of all that he has already told us. And so he says in verse 1 of chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Friends, we have people that have gone ahead of us, and for me that is encouragement. Many times as we journey this journey of faith and things seem to be closing us in, at times we pause and ask ourselves, but really, are there people that have gone ahead of me? Is there a brother or sister somewhere that could be going through exactly what I am going through? The writer is encouraging us, is telling us that the people that have journeyed this journey of faith before us, they are witnesses, and so we should draw encouragement from the life that they lived. Let us hold on to the faith just like they did, even in the midst of things and situations that are difficult. And talking about difficult situations, in light of such men and women of God that had faith, my mind goes to Father Abraham, the father of all, grandfather of all believers. Remember, God made a promise to him. And as the man was aging, the body was getting weak, and yet he still held on to the promise. Even when it was overwhelming and he decided to want to help God make the promise come quickly, God rebuked him and he still held on to the promise, and the promise eventually came to pass. God gives us promises, but like we will see later on many times, because we forget these promises, we get faint-hearted, we begin to worry ourselves, we begin to ask if this thing called faith and the things of God really, really make sense. Now, in these verses that I have read, the writer is drawing a picture in our minds of a race. He is telling us that the journey of salvation is more like a race. Now, I know many of us in school used to participate in races. And um, many of us were stubborn to the extent that if a member in our house or team or club was participating with an opponent, some of us were spectators that were trying to draw the attention of our competitors away from the race. We would even compose songs that discourage them and take their focus away from the race. And so we will be like, um, you are about to fall, or um, some of us were too bad that would compose songs that are abusing how they are dressing, just so we get their attention from the race so that our own member can run ahead of them. Now, how many of us did that? <laughs> God is gracious that he forgives us. But he tells us this journey of salvation is like you are on a race. And the end point marked for us is the other part of heaven above. But he says as you are running towards that end, there are distractions around you. There are things that are going to want to have your attention so that you lose sight of the end. And that is why he's saying, as you're running this journey of salvation, fix your eyes not on the distractions in the sides or distractions ahead of you or behind you, but fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Hallelujah. He is sure there will be things that will come to distract us, but he's calling us to have the end in mind. 
I am this side of heaven, but my desire and goal is to go to the other side of heaven. And so as I run, let not the distractions cause me to lose sight of what I want to. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Friends, as God gives us Jesus to come and die for us, he had a journey from heaven right to that cross. But in between there, the devastation, distractions. Remember after he had fasted? Remember how the devil came to him? But he said, I will not let this distraction cause me to have and to lose what I want to achieve. And what perfect example is there for us? To look at Jesus who in the midst of destruction did not lose sight of what God wants him to do. He endured everything. And that is why the writer says in verse 3, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. And I mean as the man was moving about doing his work, insults were hurled at him. People laughed at him. People mocked him. And, 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 and there was one who said, but you, the son of a carpenter who we know very well, how then can you tell us that you are the son of God? He endured everything so that we ourselves might not grow weary or faint-hearted. In other words, he took our cup of being worried on our behalf. And so every time you're tempted to be worried, can you ask yourself, why am I worried? Why am I, why am I losing peace? Because you know what, when you lose that peace, will that change anything? Will it? What does the Bible tell us about worrying? It asks us an indirect question, that who of you by worrying will do what? So why worry? Friends, Jesus took that for us. He endured that so that we might not grow weary or get faint-hearted. Now, the writer is aware that as we run this journey, there are struggles, the difficult things that come our way. But he's telling us, you know what, even if it is difficult, please do thank God that you have not come to that point of shedding blood. Hallelujah. Except for the matters. But I want to say, you and I that are journeying this journey of faith, who of us has suffered to the point of our lives being taken? And so he says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. So be encouraged. There is pain, but thank God that it has not taken the life out of you. Now, for many of us, these things, suffering and trials and faith, they do not seem to make sense. For many of us, getting saved or being born again is an imagined journey of us simply sailing and going through heaven. The road is smooth. All is well. All is good. Remember that LG appliance thing? Life is good. Yeah, you people are ancient. Eh? That was how many years ago. So for many of us, it is as if salvation is LG life has to be good and so the moment they are difficult things we kind of seem not to understand but the writer is saying you know what you are getting worried because you have forgotten something and he says to us in verse 5 you have forgotten the ex exhortation that addresses you as sons and is going to build on from that he says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. Do you know many times we are discouraged in our walk with the Lord because we have lost sight of the promises he has for us in his word? Do you know many times we forget what the word of God says pertaining our situation and because we have, we walk al around like headless chicken, we are so confused and stressed because we have lost sight. We have forgotten what the word of God says. And he says, God has a tool that he uses in his hand. 
And one of the tools that God uses to ensure that we stay focused on the goal, which is the other side of heaven, is the tool of discipline. And so he says in verse 6, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. In other words, the writer is saying that as you run this race, there are distractions. And because God is a good shepherd, who we know very well that a shepherd has a road. Remember, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want surely your rod and stuff they do what now one is for comforting the other is for pulling your ears back in the lane because it is possible for you to stray from your lane and when god sees you trying to stray he will get his rod you know they do have some bit of a curved end you know that as you're running in this curve he will try to reach for you and bring you back and friends, that process might not be smooth. In the midst of bringing you back, it is possible you will experience pain. And so he says, God has a tool which is disciplining us. He has a role over us. If we claim that God is our father, we are his sons and daughters, then he has a legal role over us. He has authority to discipline us. And the disciplining is for two major purposes. First of all, to correct us in the event that we are leaving the lane and going astray. But secondly, to train us in godliness. And so, can you ask yourself, as you go through that difficult situation, God, is this meant to correct me? Have I strayed somewhere? Is this meant to train me? Because many times, oftentimes, God has willed that you go through that so that he can correct you, so that he can train you. But it could be a mixture of the two. And yet for us Christians on this side of heaven, every time we see difficultness and suffering, the first thing that comes to our minds is that the devil is doing what? The devil is fighting us. Now, I am not here to say that there will not be times when the devil will really be against you. But of course God will allow him. So that your, test, your faith is tested. But also probably so that he can correct you. Remember the conversation in heaven about Job. By the way, one of the things I have on my to-do list when I get to heaven. Hmm? You don't have that. You only have bucket lists. B, I have both. I have a to-do list. When I get to heaven, I want to meet Job hmm? and ask him, when you discovered that God actually permitted this man to come to you, how did you feel? Well, we might, we will be in another body and... <laughs> But God permits it, even when it is engineered by the devil, God permits it and there is a purpose. And so he says in verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children are not sons. You cannot claim to have a father who is not disciplining. You know, I know this side of Uganda, some of us have had parents who we think love us because they do not rebuke us, because they do not discipline us. But I want to tell you, when you grow up, you will wish you were actually disciplined. I personally look back at the life of my dad and I growing and I am glad for the many times, by the way, I was telling the teens in the morning that my dad is not left-handed. But somewhere, somehow, God kind of gave him more strength in his left hand. When that man begins to shake his left hand, you know you are headed for disaster. And you cannot escape it because he is very quick at it. As you see it and you try to, try to run, it has already come your way. 
my father's slap, if it landed on your cheek, you will have a mark. You will not go to school and tell your friends, I fail, you know what, we are playing football. No, because it will be evident. They will see someone slapped you. And I am glad for the many times he slapped me. Then it didn't make sense. I remember one time I asked my mother in Luganda, I mean the level at which he was beating us. And for those of you that know my story, I don't know if I've shared it before here. I was born and raised in that part of the nation, Uganda, of course, not abroad, <laughs> where if you are not tough at disciplining your children, they will either end up as young mothers, as prostitutes, and as all those sorts of things. And so right now, when I look back at my agements with whom we grew up, many of them having 10, 7 children. Now, it is not bad to have children. Eh? That is not the point I'm trying to, to drive home. Not married well with about 7, 8, 10 children. Now, imagine me with 10 children. Not from one man. For some of them from about three or four, four men. And the boys sold out into drugs, lost. And some of these were group, 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 uh, group peers that I was with. I remember one day I, um, <laughs> let me say this, please do not laugh. Um, I went to a primary school that I used to brag about because in it, it had the word university. Yes. Actually, a post office box is 7062 Kampala, Uganda. You now know the school. I went to Makere University Primary School. Hey, yes. PO box 7062 Kampala, Uganda. We share the address with the university. So one time I'm going home with a friend, and my dad meets us. I greet him, and the man begins to beat my friend. And then he says, why are you working with my daughter? I tell him he's my friend at school. So, <laughs> do we have fathers like that here? <laughs> I want to tell you when that boy went to school the following day, I lost all my friends. Hmm? The other example is that of my brother, Nathan. He, he used to eat food while talking, and at times he would think the food would fall out of his mouth. And I do not remember how many slaps from my father's left hand he received. But I am glad he was beaten, and he's now a good man. He's actually wedding someone's daughter a few months from now. Imagine having that one for a husband, one who is eating, and the food is simply falling out. Eh? What is kuswankula in English? <laughs> so my father's left hand for, some of, for, for, for us was his tool of discipline. But of course there were moments he would speak to us. But what I am trying to bring home here is the writer is telling us that for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And he's telling us, if you are not disciplined by your father, you are not legitimate children. You are actually not sons. And where I grew up from, you would hear mothers say, you know what? I do not beat them. I do not correct them. Even when they see the child messing, because they are not their legal children, they think, I cannot discipline them. And then he tells us, Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for that. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Again, he relates it to our earthly fathers. Now I know many of us have a distorted image of a father. Probably because for many of us, as we grew up, the only father we knew is one that was so brutal, one that actually did not treat us as children. I remember as I was, when I was still teaching, 
I had many girls want, often time come to me and tell me, you know what, my dad this did this to me. My dad raped me, my dad did this. And if you are one of those, the image of a father and one calling God as father does not seem to make sense. Because you have a distorted image of an earthly father. But I want to encourage you. Friends, even when you have not experienced love from an earthly father, at least you know by intuition what it means to be a good father. You see it being done to other people. You see fathers taking care of their children and loving them. You might not have experienced it and yet you know what should be done. And so he says you respect your earthly fathers for disciplining you. And why not respecting God for the discipline that he gives to us? Because it is meant to make us holy and share in his holiness. And then he makes an important point in verse 11. He says for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it there should be evidence in your life as a believer that the hand of god is at work in you causing you to be trained for righteousness but also putting you on track in the event that you are going astray and that is the fruit of righteousness the intention of us being disciplined by God is so that we will bear the fruit of righteousness. It is not simply to inflict pain on us. God desires to develop righteousness in us. Now, having explained to us the purpose of the discipline, he now says, therefore, because he knows that as we go through difficult situations, we will lose morale to pray our hands will become weak our knees will become feeble and so he says you know what even in the midst of that difficult circumstance now you know that god could be using it to correct you now you now that you know that god could be using it to train you be encouraged lift up your dropping hands in verse 12 and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed he is calling us in the midst of our difficultness as we journey this journey of faith to be strengthened at that place of prayer not to give up lifting up our hands to god and seek his will in that difficult circumstance not to get tired of kneeling before god and praying He's saying, keep seeking the heart of God, the will of God in the midst of that difficult situation. Because he knows many of us will get tired to be vehicle and say, okay, God, whatever you want, let it be done. I am discouraged and that is my fate. He is saying in the midst of that challenge, lift those dropping hands to God. Even when you do not seem to understand at times, some of us think it is only the loud prayers that God will answer. You know, at times you, you can simply come to God and you are just quiet. At times you come to God and you are short of words and you simply cry it out. He says, lift those hands. He says, strengthen your feeble knees and make straight your paths. Keep seeking the Lord in the midst of that challenge as you go through that process of discipline. But secondly, he says, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for peace. You know, as we go through challenging circumstances, we have lost peace. We are worried about almost everything. And as I think about this, my mind goes to um, the fact that we can become bitter because of the difficult things that we are going through and not stop at that transfer the bitterness to other people around us people that do not even know the genesis of your circumstance they become victims because you are going through a difficult situation he is saying strive for peace with everyone do not 
do, do not, <laughs> I do not know how to say it in English, do not, because you do not have peace, do not work at ensuring that everyone else is like you. Do not take peace from the people around you, but rather strive for peace, even as you go through that difficultness. He says in 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And as a, a student, I remember many times our teacher of maths, there were mornings in prep that he would come, and before you know it, without even saying good morning, the man will say, all of you lie down. In the morning. And you know some of us would go to prep without having a bath first. And before you even bathe, you have received for yourself canes. And as you go back to bathe, I mean the flesh around that part is swelling and you have to shower. But also reminds me he was sleeping on campus. And there would be times as you would pass by through there, around their home, that you would hear noises. And there were usually noises of him beating the wife. And actually teachers had baptized him piso. You know I need though. Because he was so bitter. And many times I think it now dawns on me that probably the, the mornings would come to beat us. He might have had a quarrel with the wife that is now transferring the bitterness to us innocent children. He says... See to it that no one is bitter because bitterness causes trouble. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. Remember, we are running to heaven. And these are things he's calling us to do. Not to be sexually immoral. What is it that is defiling you in this area? For many of us, the temptation of sleeping around with almost everyone and yet we are in fellowship, you tell yourself, okay, today, God, this is the last time. This is the last time. A few weeks down the road, you are fallen again. For some of us, it could be one of those uh, men that have big stomachs that drive to campus, take you to KFC, take you to Java's that are causing you to defile yourself in this area. But he also makes mention of one person. He says, do not be unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And as I thought about birthright, as children of God, there are those things and promises that God has ordained for us. But many times, because we are looking at satisfaction that is not permanent, we end up selling a birthright. We end up compromising. Now, you live in Kampala. I will not labor much to tell you about carpet interviews. You know these things. My friends, the teens, didn't know, and I had to explain to them that a carpet interview is not an interview where you and the MD sit and you answer questions while seated on a carpet. It is where he tells you, please come to this room, sleep with me, and I will give you the job. And he actually says it will only be once. And so you say, okay, it is for once. I have looked around for jobs for five, eight years. Let me just do this one time and I will get this job. You are selling your birthright. May God help us. And so he says this man is so, sold his birthright for a single meal. But the time his eyes were open to what a birthright meant and the blessing therein, he cried so much to have it, and yet he never got it back. May God help us. May he open our eyes as we journey this journey of salvation to know that there are certain things he calls us not to do, but also to appreciate that this tool of discipline in the hand of God our Father is meant for our own good. And I want to believe that no father will want to discipline their children and simply kill them. As they discipline us, they will use the other hand to bring us into their chest and ask us to be quiet because they are with us. And that is what our God does for us. He has a tool in his hand to correct us. He has a tool to train us. 
And so he calls us to appreciate the purpose for which he is trying to correct us. He has in mind an end, and that is for us to be with him. And so as we journey, let us strengthen our prayer life, lift up our dropping hands, strengthen our weakness. Let us strive for peace with the people among whom we live. Let us ensure there is no bitterness among us. Let us ensure that none of us is found sexually immoral. Let us ensure that none of us sells their birthright for happiness that will not last. May God bless us. May he give us the grace to do that. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May God bless you.